Hello, welcome to the 13th webinar in this year's new barn raising webinar series. The subject today is going green and saving money. I'm Gareth Potts. I set up the new barn raising program. There is a program website, the and that has a lot of free to download practical resources uh, that outline different ways to sustain community and civic assets. So I hope you're able to give that a look at some stage. Today's focus is really looking at how community and civic assets can undertake different types of sustainability measures, such as saving or generating energy, waste reduction, conservation and reuse of water, those type of things, and also save money in the process of doing that. The first voice you'll hear will be Jenny Benedict. Jenny is director of the West Vancouver Memorial Library in British Columbia, Canada. She's been director for six years, and during that time, she's led on proposals for the library building and on the sustainability communications plan, so outlining the achievements and uh, plans for the future around sustainability. Jenny practices what she preaches. She participates in Bike to Work Week and also regularly walks or cycles to work. Away from work, she's also refitted an 800 square foot cabin with uh, reusable materials. Joining Jenny is her colleague, Julie Backer, who is a librarian and has experience of working in public, academic and special libraries across British Columbia and Alberta over the last 30 years. Julie has been a member of the library's green team since its inception in 2006. Uh, and a few years back, she wrote a chapter for an award-winning book called Greening Libraries, published by Library Juice Press, uh, in which she outlined the work of the green team. And away from work, she belongs to Modo, the Metro Vancouver car co-op. The final speaker is Jennifer Hale of the Denver Zoological Foundation in Colorado. Jennifer is the Director of Safety and Sustainability at the Foundation. Her team has international standard certifications for both the environmental work and its health and safety work. During her time there, the Foundation won the inaugural Association of Zoos and Aquariums Green Award. That's, that's a North American uh, organization. And Jennifer was also the chair between 2012 and 2014 of the AZA's Green Scientific Advisory Group. She is a scientist by training. Uh, she has a bachelor's degree in ecology and evolutionary biology from the University of Arizona. And away from work, she is the sustainability chair of her local neighborhood improvement association. And she also has a backyard farm in her garden at home. So those are the speakers, and uh, as promised, I'm going to hand you over now to Jenny Benedict in West Vancouver. Thank you, Gareth. Um, we're honored to be a part of this international webinar series that brings awareness to practices around sustaining public and community spaces, which are just so important to the quality of uh, life for our residents. Here in West Vancouver, as in many parts of the world, we're keenly aware of climate change. While we have a bit of a reputation for being a wet city, this summer we had a long 22-day spell in June with no rain, which put us into stage three water restrictions until early September. For the better part of a week, we were under air quality warnings due to thick smoke from forest fires, which turned the sun orange and made the sky dark and really apical. So it was actually really um, quite scary. Uh, and then in late August, we had a w wicked windstorm uh, that knocked out po power for half a million people. So we're certainly pleased that we acknowledged almost 10 years ago that we needed to be adapting to our changing world. Our dedication to sustainability started with a desire to reduce our impact on our very beautiful and precious environment. Our savings, as in the title of the webinar, Going Green and Saving Money, has come primarily in two areas, uh, responsible resource management and reusing materials. A third area that is perhaps the least easy to quantify is environmental stewardship. This speaks to the savings in natural resources that we have not consumed, and also to the cost of replenishing natural resources that we have. This is something that we're just beginning to think about. It became quite apparent with the windstorms that I mentioned when the city of Vancouver had to replace much of the urban tree canopy by purchasing new trees. So in a moment, I'm going to set some context for our library and our sustainability initiatives. And then Julie is going to share some of the practices that we've implemented and highlight a few of our accomplishments. Hello, everyone. 
I'd like to share with you a snapshot of our community so that you can see just how beautiful West Vancouver is. This is a shot taken from the water which shows our scenic coastline that stretches for almost 20 kilometers and our towering mountains behind that are home to many creeks, waterfalls, parks, and even an old growth forest. This is indeed a landscape worthy of preserving. So this is the front of our library. We're co located in the Ambleside neighborhood across from Memorial Park and between our main town center and our award-winning community center. The library opened in 1950 and has been expanded five times such that it is now a 50,000 square foot building. This is the original 1950 hall to which a two-story south wing was added in 1957 then the Jubilee Wing in 1962, followed by the West Wing and rooftop parking in 1977, and finally a four-story East Wing in 1993 that replaced the Jubilee Wing. As you can see, this resulted in a building with a patchwork structure with a variety of roofing types, and also each of these sections had their own mechanical and electrical systems. Over the years, this presented significant challenges to ongoing maintenance, operating costs, and environmental efficiency. This timeline shows the phases of our implementation and key milestones along the way. In 2006, a staff green team formed, and they really egged each other on to come up with new ways to redu reduce resource consumption and to eliminate solid waste. Being mindful of the library's ecological footprint became a bit infectious in the organization, and the library board uh, got engaged adopting a green buildings operation policy in 2009. In 2011, we were awarded our LEED certification, which we'll speak about in more detail shortly. Also in 2011, the library board adopted sustainability as one of five core values of the library's 2011 to 2015 strategic plan. That value statement said, we are committed to managing our resources responsibly to enhance our financial stability, social goodwill, and environmental leadership. Since 2012, we've been retrofitting our building with the intention of sustaining it for another 20 years. Just last month, our 2016 to 2020 strategic plan, sustainability remains one of our five core values with a slightly revised statement. We manage our resources responsibly to maintain financial, social, and environmental sustainability for the well-being of our community. For those of you who may not be familiar with LEED certification, it is a program administered by the Canada Green Building Council. It encourages and accelerates the adoption of sustainable green building practices through the creation and implementation of internationally recognized and accepted tools and performance criteria. It's a rigorous application process that uh, requires significant documentation and demonstration in these six categories. Staff took a thousand steps over a five-year period to achieve the standard. Julie is going to speak to each of the six categories. To meet LEED Canada's requirements for sustainable site, we focused on three initiatives. Landscape management around the facility, carbon emissions reduction, and public transportation. In 2008, the library sold its large bookmobile and purchased a compact fuel-efficient vehicle for home service deliveries to the community. A staff transportation survey conducted in 2010 revealed that by then, 52% of staff members used an alternative mode of transportation other than a single occupant vehicle. We continue to encourage our staff to use alternative modes with programs like Bike to Work Week. Our older building with its various wings does not have any purpose-built areas that support cyclists, such as on-site showers or bicycle storage. However, we have designated an area in one of the larger staff bathrooms for bike parking. We also added a rolling coat rack in this same bathroom for staff to hang towels and extra clothes. Between 2006 and 2010, we achieved a 68% reduction in water consumption. 
We did this by upgrading our plumbing by changing 22 toilets to low flow and dual flush. We also adopted a more efficient irrigation strategy by reducing the watering frequency as well as planting more native grasses rather than flowering plants that require watering in the heat of summer. We continue to look for ways to save water. For example, at the height of the water restrictions this past summer, we closed three of the five stalls in a staff washroom, so maintenance staff only had to use water to clean two rather than five stalls. Although the autumn rains have returned, we have not reopened the extra stalls. There have been zero staff complaints. Reducing our electric power consumption was one of our first major breakthroughs. We discovered that by simply not turning on unnecessary lights before opening, powering down our computers when not in use, and generally encouraging staff to turn it off, our hydro bill dropped dramatically. We also achieved a significant reduction in natural gas usage. Together, these results indicate that the library's energy performance is 29% better than the average performance of similar existing buildings. All of these savings were achieved without compromising the comfort of staff or the public. You may notice that both our energy usage and energy expenditure graphs end in 2012. Our greatest reductions had been achieved over the 20, 2006 to 2012 period. Any changes you see now are just seasonal variations depending on how cold the winter or how warm the summer is. When we look at how this reduction translates into costs, over six years, six years we saved almost $135,000, and this doesn't even take into account the rising costs of gas and fuel. These savings, in turn, were applied to infrastructure maintenance, which extends the life of our facility. We have some dreams about further energy savings through larger infrastructure changes, such as solar panels on the roof or rainwater diversion. However, at this point, they are long-term aspirations. To reduce the environmental impact of materials used for the building's operations, maintenance, and upgrades, the library adopted a green building's operation policy in 2009, which guides decisions regarding purchasing, housekeeping, solid waste management, integrated pest management, erosion control, landscape management, and plumbing. Staff also pursued many ways to reduce, reuse, and recycle. For those who don't work in the library world, we produce a variety of types of waste, with the bulk of it coming from the staff maintaining and running a library, along with the usual waste produced by the users of a public building. For well over 20 years, our municipality has separated its newsprint and mixed paper from the regular garbage stream. Staff was concerned about the other materials going into landfill, packing material, coffee cups, discarded collections of obsolete material. How do you dispose of an old videotape collection? We research ways to recycle as much as possible. And now, in addition to mixed paper and newsprint, staff also have separate bins for cardboard, hard plastics, soft plastics, styrofoam, and coffee cups. And you can see that area on the right-hand uh, photo in the slide. In addition to staff computers, our library also has a large community computing center for the public. The computers are refreshed on a regular basis, so the library also has a lot of electronic waste. Our region has an electronic waste recycling program, which our municipality participates in. As for organic waste, early green team efforts included diverting compost from the staff room, fruit and vegetable peelings, coffee grounds, and the like, into a worm compost bin on site. The worms could not keep up with us, so we had a large pail in the staff room for compost, which was taken home by grateful staff gardeners to add to their home compost piles. Within a few years, the municipality caught up to our efforts. In 2013, the library was a pilot site for a municipal composting program, which was then implemented in other municipal facilities. Eventually, it became a community-wide green can program to separate organic waste from garbage. So residents now have a green can pickup from their curb. In 2014, paper towels were added to the list of acceptable items to put in the green cans, which made a big difference in the volume of waste. 
You can see in the left hand of the slide the waste bins provided for the public, which separate waste into three streams, mixed paper, recyclable cans and bottles, and garbage. We also have a number of bins throughout the library for discarded coffee cups, which we also recycle. Now we only have garbage pickup once a week rather than twice, which also turns into cost savings. In order to improve air quality, we increase the amount of outside air coming into the building by using CO2 ventilation control and improving our exhaust systems. We also adopted a green cleaning policy that applies to the purchase, use, maintenance, and disposal of all cleaning materials. Clean air is critical to the well-being of our building staff and visitors. Once we realized successes with our own library, we were inspired to share our story. We started doing this through education and outreach programs such as celebrating Earth Week, lending energy meters to the public, hosting library conference sessions on green themes, doing themed lectures, displays, and story times and highlighting sustainability issues and events on our social media platforms. As a library, we also ensure that we have many resources that disseminate theoretical, factual, and innovative information about the ongoing ecological challenges of our era. We've collected these into a web resource page called Environment and Sustainability. I'm going to turn it back to Jenny, who's going to talk about retrofitting our facility. Thank you, Julie. Our library is of a tremendous historical significance to our community. It's an official war memorial dedicated as a living monument and an everlasting commemoration to those who sacrificed their lives in World War II. Tomorrow, we will commemorate our 65th anniversary with a community ceremony in front of the memorial arch across the street. This symbolic value and the community's 65-year investment in the facility both feed into our decision to sustain and enhance it. Over the last six years, we've had three building assessments completed, an energy efficiency assessment, a seismic assessment, and a life cycle assessment. These have given us the tools to understand the scope and the magnitude of work that will be required over the next 20 years. In the last five years, our municipal government, who is the major funder of our capital projects, has invested a little over $2 million in facility infrastructure renewal. And to give you some sort of context um, of that in British Columbia, to replace a 56,000 square foot building uh, at this point would be upwards of about $30 million. Our initial projects have addressed the building envelope and systems, and work that has been completed includes a new long-lasting cost-effective metal roof, structural reinforcements of our historic stone walls, the installation of energy-efficient windows and new exterior doors, mechanical unit consolidation with the installation of high-efficiency air handling and boiler units and upgrading of controls, and work on our domestic water distribution system to replace water lines, electric water heaters, drinking fountains, and we've also renovated two of our washrooms. Early on, our projects served as examples and pilots for our mun municipal government which have inspired them to, to develop and implement plans on a broader cross-divisional scale. Now the District of West Vancouver is taking the lead and making significant strides in energy, financial, and waste management. In terms of energy management, the district has an energy manager who has an annual work plan to reduce gas and electricity consumption. A West Vancouver Community Energy and Emissions Plan Working Group has been formed to evaluate West Vancouver's community energy use and greenhouse gas emissions, which comes predominantly from residential buildings. They will also be identifying community targets and developing a community energy and emissions plan. In terms of financial management, uh, the district is a leader in BC municipal governments for the work that they've done in this area. They've de developed asset replacement schedules and a long-term sustainability financial plan for infrastructure renewal.
So we've completed an inventory of all capital assets, including roads and bridges, buildings, IT, vehicles, machinery and equipment across all the divisions. So that's fire and police and the recreational facilities, et cetera. And then developed a database with replacement costs over the next 20 years. The data has then been turned into cost projections for maintaining the infrastructure and a plan for funding those costs. In terms of waste management, as uh, Julie spoke to earlier, there's now curbside collection of both a green can for um, organic waste in addition to weekly blue box, gray box, and yellow bat pickup. Garbage collection has now been reduced to every other week. In addition to the financial and infrastructure benefits of our sustainability initiatives, I'd also like to mention the social impact. In this photo are representatives of the staff green team and the library board green committee who started it all. Their much deserved pride from achieving the LEAD award is long lasting and a legacy within the organization. Staff really coalesced as a team partly due to them finding the personal values that they had in common and also from seeing their individual efforts having such a big impact. All staff were empowered to bring forward suggestions and recommendation and no idea was considered too small. A lot of people doing little things produced the results that Julie shared. The team also felt part of the broader environmental zeitgeist of the Pacific Northwest in bringing thinking globally and acting locally to life in our community. To see our library board and our municipal staff and council champion their efforts infused our staff with hope for the future. I'd like to give a special shout out to our building services supervisor, Chad Arsenault, who this year received a district employee recognition award in the excellence and sustainability category. Chad's commitment inspires others to make healthy choices for the library and the planet, and it is really truly due to him that much of this has happened. We're truly uh, grateful to those who have supported our journey and continue to do so, and to everyone who is on a similar path who we can learn from and be inspired by. In particular, I'd like to mention the West Vancouver Memorial Library Foundation and a generous bequest from the Patrick Estate that supported the initial building assessment and the lead application process. And also our thanks go to the District of West Vancouver for the support of our capital projects. Much of the information that we've shared today is available on our website. Please visit westvanlibrary.ca slash about us slash sustainability for the full reports and documents. So that concludes our presentation. Uh, we'd like to say a big thank you to Gareth for organizing the series and giving us the opportunity to share our story. So back to you. Thanks very much, Jenny, and thanks very much, Julie. That was a fascinating presentation uh, covering a vast amount of ground about uh, outlining your good work over the last decade. So I'm going to hand you over now to Jennifer Hale in uh, Denver. So Jennifer, over to you, please. Thank you, Gareth. I'm excited to be here today to share with this community the story of Denver Zoo's sustainability programs. The focus of my presentation today will be on how Denver Zoo has leveraged our sustainability efforts from a grassroots-driven program into a committed position with our business operations, allowing Denver Zoo to holistically look at our organization and understand how we can best reduce our impacts to the environment and adopting innovation to drive those strategies. But first, a little background about our organization. Denver Zoo is the most popular cultural attraction in the state of Colorado, with over two million guests served annually. We are located east of downtown Denver on an 80-acre campus in Denver's historic city park. The Denver Zoo started in 1896. The zoo is managed by the Denver Zoological Foundation, which is a 5013C nonprofit. The foundation organizes or manages, sorry, the zoo for the people of city and county of Denver and for the general public in cooperation with Denver Parks and Rec. From a financial perspective, Denver Zoo's total operating expenses are around $32.9 million annually. And as you can see in this uh, figure here, the breakdown of those expenses are significantly spent in animal care and research. 
We received heavily our funding from uh, Gate and Mission and uh, the Scientific and Cultural Facilities Dist District, SCFD, which is a fund generated by the percentage of sales and use tax in the seven county metro er Denver area. Our mission at Denver Zoo is to secure a better world for animals through human understanding. And as part of that mission, our core pillars of our operation include animal care, conservation, education, and people. And under the framework of conservation, which shows our commitment to sustainable practices as part of our operations. But let's step back and how do we define sustainability at Denver Zoo? We really look at sustainability as three is the crossroads between economics, environment, and the social aspects of our business. And where those three meet is a balance of our operations and how we can meet our current needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Getting started, so our sustainability programs at Denver Zoo, like many programs um, around, uh, around the nation, really started with a grassroots effort of passionate people within the zoo that really wanted to make sure that we were walking the talk and standing against our mission in terms of our own operations. So when we were out working on conservation and, and um, helping with habitat uh, restoration, were we really doing the right things and making the right decisions in terms of our operations back at the 80-acre campus? So this team of uh, individuals that would meet around lunchtime uh, to talk about our recycling efforts or water conservation efforts really drove uh, the framework that we use today and the focus about what gets measured gets managed. And then through their focus attention on measurement, this team was really able to start to build kind of baseline information for us to better understand where our opportunities existed. They also set the expectations within our organization about measurement and the impacts from our operations. We were able to take these numbers and start building stronger partnerships within our community, with our utility providers, with city and county of Denver, and with the state of Colorado. This framework or this ground, grassroots efforts really allowed the zoo to look at a system of our operations as a whole, kind of like an ecosystem, and we were to develop strategies that could support both our mission and our sustainability goals uh, together. This effort really helped zoo staff understand how their local impacts on resources also had a regional, national, and global implications. The team's first success started with water. So by performing a full-scale audit in 1999 with our uh, great supporter at Denver Water, the team was able to look at every spigot, hose, water feature, sprinkler, etc., and found that the zoo was using around 388 million gallons of water. Well, for the West, that's a lot of water, and there was a lot of opportunities identified through this audit to reduce our impacts such that by 2006, the team had implemented a number of projects zoo-wide and we were able to drop our water usage to 185 million gallons. Now, this eff the effort that was taken is absolutely a success and something we celebrated here at Denver Zoo, but what the team realized it was really accomplishing was addressing the low-hanging fruit. And it was a great place to start, but for us to really make a demonstrated effort in leadership and sustainability, we needed to move beyond the focus of low-hanging fruit and the focus of just a few individuals forming this grassroots effort. And our programs here at the zoo, in order to reach the top and to hit every last thousand gallon of water that was wasteful, that we really needed to drive this into our business practices and become part of our daily up operations and the expectation and everyone's job responsibility to do the right thing. So with full support from our executive leadership, Denver Zoo adopted a formal framework based on the continual improvement process. This continual improvement process is kind of the defining uh, framework or aspects around ISO's 14001 environmental management standard and we refer to this program internally with the zoo as our sustainable management system. At the heart of this system is the policies that Denver Zoo has, both for occupational health and safety and our environmental policies, which is commitments made by our executive leadership that Denver Zoo would uphold to prevention of pollution, commitments to legal and other requirements, and to continual improvement. 
and through the formal frameworks of ISO 14001 and OHS 18001, Denver Zoo has leveraged our sustainable management system to be third-party certified for both standards, and we're the first zoo within the Western Hemisphere to have this dual certification. What does continual improvement mean in terms of improvements of our staff and engagement? We really did see in a change when this program started off uh, back in 2008 that it increased our staff awareness. Um, it increased staff the need for in-house expertise. We were able to identify in areas of the zoo where we needed to really f hire in-house expertise to focus on life support. Um, or specific things around energy management. Uh, so it really started driving kind of where our gaps in, uh, in knowledge were and where we could drive um, bringing in ex experts that had those focus areas as part of their job descriptions to kind of help the overall zoo um, in their operational impacts. In addition, it allowed us to start designing future use um, in terms of acts to conserve water and implement efficient use. So when we looked, thought about, looked back at those 2006 water numbers, in 2014, we're using 152 million gallons of water, dropping from that 185 in 2006. So with continual uh, focus and attention and awareness by our staff, we find additional 1,000 gallons of water to save, um, additional opportunities to conserve natural resources, and in addition, using innovation. Um, so we partnered with Denver Water to look at how we could reduce our impacts on potable water use. And here in uh, Denver, Colorado, we have access to a program called Recycled Water, which is water that is uh, clean to the 1982 drinking water standards. And we're able to use within our exhibits for exhibit uh, water features and for cleaning purposes and really reducing the impact on potable water needs here in the West. Where does that leverage next? And I think the exciting opportunity in terms of Denver Zoo's kind of SMS and just the culmination of um, everyone's awareness and, and the programs moving forward, it really allowed us to take uh, opportunity to take an even bigger risk and look at innovation from a, a holistic standpoint of both the waste that we generate on site, our energy that we use on site, and being able to kind of understand our operations at this rigorous level. Um, lend us to the, the opportunity to research and develop an on-site uh, waste to energy system. So our focus over the past 10 years uh, has been on developing and engineering and testing the opportunity of taking 90% of the zoo's waste stream pictured here, developing a fuel pellet, uh, and then using that fuel pellet to uh, convert into energy, on-site energy. And the way this technology works is was using the um, uh, framework of gasification, where this uh, pellet would be exposed to high temperatures, um, 800 degrees C, and would degrade and create a synthetic gas. And that synthetic gas could produce, um, be combusted to produce energy. And the type of results we were looking at in terms of our research and development on this program was around 1 million kilowatt hours a year and 600,000 BTUs an hour of just thermal energy from the system. On the financial side, it would save the zoo about $200,000 a year in hauling costs, um, which would reduce our landfill contribution by 1.5 million pounds a year. These two things, mainly the 1.5 million pounds a year, was really the focus in terms of helping Denver Zoo reach one of our biggest goals that we've set to become a zero waste facility by 2025. In addition, when you think about your sustainability footprint and becoming a zero waste facility, Denver Zoo took the opportunity to look upstream as well. So in support uh, of that goal, we began to do a, a mini life cycle comparison of our products that we bought that ultimately had an end of life at the zoo, and we had to determine what the end of life is in terms of diverting it from the landfill. So we recently uh, are still in the development of this program and have adopted it as part of our purchasing efforts, uh, but we have an online purchasing program that screens all products that come into the zoo on factors of sustainability, economics, um, we even look at uh, manufacturers and the suppliers. And then we're able to weigh um, and score those products and develop a purchasing uh, catalog for our staff so that they know that they're making the right decision when they're buying uh, a pen or a ream of paper um, and cleaning products for their office spaces.
In addition, on the back side, this really helps us in terms of streamlining what it is we're bringing so that we can, at the end of life, either recycle it. And at the future point was hopefully that this an item could either be recycled or for fuel. However, uh, most recently, Denver Zoo um, had to make a tough decision with our waste to energy program, and we had to stop construction development on site of this program and to seek support technically and financially outside the organization so that this exciting, innovative project can continue full development um, outside of the zoo and working with partners that we could identify in the community. We were very proud of the efforts that we efforts with this program and the conversation that we pushed about looking at waste management at a different level and looking at it from a facility standpoint and how could you use on-site resources that had benefit at the end of life and continue to use them and use it to, to create energy. So this effort, um, I would say, has really kind of driven a lot of um, zoos and aquariums today that are identifying their opportunities to develop waste to energy conversion um, as part of their waste management strategies. And although this project will no longer be part of our 80 acre campus at Denver Zoo, we will remain committed to innovation as it is a core to our mission. So what's next for Denver Zoo? Moving forward, uh, I think we're we're leaning more towards developing a very transparent discussion and to join the dialogue that's happening globally around climate change. Denver Zoo will be looking at taking all our metric information and rolling it in to develop a very clear message around how our energy use relates back to greenhouse gas emissions, our transportation use, the products we buy, um, the waste we generate, so that we can begin to have uh, a dialogue, not only with the interested public, but regionally with our other companies, with our stakeholders at the state, within the city, and really show how Denver Zoo is making a measured impact to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and supporting our mission. In addition to the discussion around greenhouse gas emissions, we are looking at defining, changing our definition of sustainability to one that takes into consideration uh, about the changing and evolving world we live in. How will Denver Zoo adapt to the changes and have the ability to protect and nurture the natural systems in which we operate? And this is an exciting challenge for us, um, especially here in the West, and something we begin partnering with um, our regional um, experts and uh, individuals in the field to really develop a plan moving forward that looks at smart development for our organization, um, taking in, in, into the risks that we may see here um, in the West with water, with food resources, um, population, etc. So with that, I thank you very much, Gareth, for the time and for everyone to um, to listen to uh, the story of our journey, um, I, I invite anyone to contact me directly with any questions you may have about our program, specifically metrics regarding things that we've implemented and move forward on. Um, but I really was looking for the opportunity to share TA today with everyone the broader picture of how we rolled our programs from a grassroots effort into really a business operation that is um, an expectation of everyone's job responsibility and just the way we do business. It's part of our strategic uh, imperatives and um, the way of life for Denver Zoo. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Jennifer. There's a really comprehensive presentation there that covering both the, the, the amazing management systems you have in place, but also the, the sort of considerable innovation as well. And you don't don't necessarily get both of those things uh, in, in many organizations. Please do send in questions. I'm going to take the first question on the rank here. It's from a, a very well-known zoo in, in the United Kingdom. Beyond the feel-good factor, have you incentivized zoo staff or considered staff benefiting directly from savings, such as as improved staff recreation facilities or even a bonus? Uh, this is a real opportunity, I think, in the field of sustainability. And I know that there's folks out there that have um, probably accomplished this more than we have. Uh, in terms of incentivize, we know that our staff here are very driven by incentives. Um, we've done kind of um, more action-based incentives of like helping encourage them to ride their bike uh, or get on a bus. Um, to submit ideas, you know, in terms of a safety finding or submit ideas of is there an area of the zoo that they feel that has an opportunity for energy reduction. Um, every zoo's full-time staff member here at the zoo gets a eco pass, which is a um, uh, 
public transportation uh, card that they can use uh, both in their personal life and in terms of transportation to zoo, but it basically gives them a free ride um, to get here to the zoo without using their car. Uh, we are looking at, I work really closely with our maintenance department team in terms of operations and identifying grants uh, and funding, uh, rebates, et cetera, to kind of help them move forward on energy efficiency, water conservation projects. So have a pretty good wor working relationship with that department. And actually they're uh, gold star. They just, they, they're always looking for opportunities and really bring, um, you know, raise the stakes for me in terms of, uh, things that they can be implemented and concepts and ideas that we need to move forward to kind of stay innovative and, and leaders um, in sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I mean, I, I guess we can pass that, that same question really to, to, to Jenny and Julie. So this is Jenny, and um, I will mention that our district has the uh, their recognition award, and there is an excellence in sustainability award that's given annually. Uh, so that's uh, that's probably the main um, incentive for staff, uh, and not that I don't think anyone's you know initiating sustainability initiatives just so that they can win that award. I do think it is the intrinsic motivation um, here, and it's very much at a grassroots uh, level. Okay, thank you. And then there's another question for the library here. Um, is there a first sustainability step that most libraries could and should be doing? Well, I think the uh, early steps and first steps that are so easy to do are to do the low flush toilets. Uh, most libraries, and well, and, and you know, libraries range in scale from very small to quite large. But if you have a, a, a public building with a lot of washrooms, then that's an easy first step uh, to reduce water consumption. Uh, recycling. Um, there's a, a lot of materials. There's a lot of packaging that comes into libraries, and really thinking about how you're processing and and uh, getting rid of that waste, I think, is very important. Uh, and then probably in terms, the third one, I would say, uh, if I had to pick my top three, these are my top three. Uh, in terms of uh, cost savings, really on the electricity, uh, it's amazing what a difference it can make just not to turn on your lights until you know 10 o'clock when it's time to open the front doors and just be mindful about what's being left on overnight. Um, those are easy, quick things, low-hanging fruit to grab onto. Yeah. To me, it almost doesn't matter what you choose. I think it's uh, also the enthusiasm that's generated from the staff in being able to come up with something that um, has an ecological or environmental benefit. And that enthusiasm just keeps growing. And um, uh, before you know it, uh, it's uh, captured the imagination of the entire staff. Okay, thank you. I'm just looking. There's a couple of questions that are related here, really, around about around the issue of training. Is it all on the job, or is there a combination of you know going on courses or online or reading books? Uh, for here, for staff, uh, a lot of the training is on the job. Uh, we do have kind of policy where folks can come talk with us if they have interest in a specific area. Um, say, you know, how do I make my life, you know, reduce um, uh, my consumption, you know, and you know, concepts that they want to explore in terms of their own personal lives. We we serve as kind of a, a resource and mentors for individuals. But when it comes to things at their job, we really, I mean, when I first started, I shadowed um, each department, and it's interesting to have that experience of staff members say, "Whoa, what do you, you know, can't come in and change my job," but then when they were realizing that. I was coming in saying, wow, if we tried this method, it would save you time and, and you would be able to have more time working with the animals versus cleaning. Um, and then in turn, it saves me in terms of the amount of chemicals you're using, the water you're using, etc. cetera. Um, so a lot of it has been on the job training. As part of our SMS and that formal framework, we have a lot of training that performed in terms of meeting the re regulatory requirements and we give our staff a lot of information and resources within those trainings. But it really comes down to we're a small enough staff that we can meet with individuals um, and uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and kind of help them with any 
opportunities. Um, in terms of our maintenance staff, there's definitely courses that we identify for them outside. Great partnerships with our utility providers, both Denver Water and Excel, where individuals can go get uh, coursework from, from those outside resources to expand their knowledge. Jenny, Julie, did you want to come back on that? Sure. Um, I'll just add that uh, I think at this point, finding efficiencies is just such a mindset throughout our staff. And it's predominantly just the peer-to-peer -peer learning. Uh, and we've now got to where, to where across municipal divisions there are sort of uh, sustainability champions in other departments like engineering and over at our community center. And they now gather as a, a green team that's cross-divisional across the district. And they're just like, you know, little sponges to hear what their other peers have been doing and what's been successful. And that just generates more ideas ideas and uh, we have such an openness to just um, try <laughs> and uh, see you know see if it is going to achieve the efficiency uh, that that's it, how we have sort of a continuous learning kind of culture within the organization great thank you um, another question about libraries is it staff that are doing environmental work kind of on the side, as it were, on the side of their main duties as librarians, or is it, do you have some staff that are dedicated to this? Uh, so we do have a, a maintenance department, and our uh, maintenance services supervisor, it is certainly well built uh, into his position, and we're just extremely fortunate that uh, his personal um, values are also just extraordinarily well aligned. Uh, so he does drive um, a lot of the monitoring, a lot of the sort of identifying opportunities for staff. Uh, and then for other departments, um, like our acquisitions department is the department that's responsible for ordering and receiving everything that comes into the library. So it's kind of an integral part of that person's job that when they're doing purchasing, when they're unpacking things, um, et cetera, to be just mindful of what's coming in and what's going out. Great. Um, thanks, Jenny. In terms of you mentioned, there's a, question, a few questions about the lead process. You mentioned, both mentioned uh, the lead process. Is that something you would recommend uh, other libraries or other zoos to pursue? Uh, this is definitely a question that um, I'm a member of the Zoo as Association of Zoos and Aquariums Green Scientific Advisory Board. And this is something that we've um, talked as a team quite a bit about is the different green building standards that exist for zoos and aquariums. Um, LEED is definitely one that's available um, for institutions to look at, though I would encourage them to look at things like uh, Living Building uh, Challenge. Um, Green Globes, I think, is another one uh, that a, a lot of institutions have adopted. Um, challenge with LEED is it's very much tailored towards kind of large, complex building, you know, office-type building complexes where zoos have the unique opportunity that we've got animals we're caring for. So we may have an exhibit that's a tropical exhibit. And yes, regionally, I need to have a set temperature point. But if I'm maintaining a, a population of, of animals that are from the tropics and need high humidity and high temperatures, it's hard to kind of balance that with the, the lead process. So um, I think we definitely, as institutions, look at that as a, as a good standard. But I think there's a lot of standards out there that have the opportunity and flexibility um, to be used. Our certification is an existing buildings, operations, and maintenance uh, certification, which in, um, in the Canada systems, there's the existing buildings track, and then there's also for new buildings, which is maybe what people are more familiar with. Um, and I would say a, a lot depends on sort of where you are as an organization and, and what your facility is like. If you really need uh, the rigor of of a laid out uh, plan and process and to take your organization through that in order to um, then at the end have uh, that award that you can sort of very proudly display, then absolutely, uh, I think it, it's a tremendous uh, program for doing that. I think if you have a, a, a 
very well self-disciplined kind of organization, you could equally well take um, the standards and the categories that are laid out. You could also look at other standards and kind of, you know, uh, do custom fit it to your organization and then implement it uh, with and not do it within the framework of, of LEAD. I don't see any more questions coming in. So uh, I'd really just like to thank our speakers today, uh, Jenny Benedict and Julie Backer of West Vancouver Memorial Library and Jennifer Hale of Denver Zoological Foundation. But thanks to you for listening.